Welcome everybody. Welcome to the closing ceremony. It's our last day. I'm sad, but I'm happy. I'm so very happy. What about you? Are you feeling fine? Oh, that's great. We have had a great time. I've learned so many things. I've listened to so many interesting speeches, debates. Uh, I've been networking. What about you? Have you got new friends so in social media? Connecting, learning. It, this has uh, been such an interesting uh, time for me and I hope for you. Uh, this is the closing ceremony and we will have minister debate and music. Variety of beautiful music pieces, new compositions, folk music. Um, but first of all, I would like to introduce to you the one and only Drul Dallerup. Drul Dallerup is professor of political science in Stockholm University. She's working as a consultant uh, to countries, to women's movements around the world. She's been uh, working for UNDP, IPU, Kvinna till Kvinna. She's been engaged in, in researching, in empowering women in Middle East, North Africa. <laughs> Trul, it's fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> how, has your, how has your week been? Well, it's been hard working four days. Uh, it's been very inspiring four days. It has, in fact, been fantastic four days. Yeah. And, you know, um, some people have said that the women's movement is more or less dead. I think that the Nordic Forum has proved that is not the case. The women's movement is alive. Mm. <laughs> But, of course, the women's movement can be stronger. And I urge all of you to mobilize at least three people around you, your friends, to be active in the women's movement, because the Nordic women's movement have to be stronger. Oh. Well, what about then I want to ask you then. Yes? <laughs> uh, because I, in some, you know, I'm, I'm in politics. I study politics, and uh, we are all in politics here. But in some way, I think that this forum, I was also in Oslo in 88, in Åbo in 94. I think this one, the art, has been much more uh, dominant uh, in a very good sense than in the first two Nordic Forum. And I have a sense I want to ask you about that. Isn't it a fact that feminism is most alive today in art? I would say yes. And I think art has such a great impact on how we can identify ourselves in society, how we can uh, see ourselves, understand, when we read books to children, when we yeah. see theatre plays, uh, that we can see that this is me or this is my life. It has a great impact on how we understand our authority as ourselves in the society. And um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm leading a workshop for an organization, for a network in Sweden, and it's a feminist, free feminist discussion and And this is not... <laughs> This is not a, a big country, but can you imagine how many groups? Feminist theater groups? 53 wow. feminist groups wow. in Sweden. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And there is also another network I'm part of, and that is PUSH. And that is an organization or association for black artists in Sweden. And uh, we also have a catalog so that the... Uh, people who are um, working um, as uh, directors or theater houses can find us. And it's really also improving. So there's a lot of improvement going on here right now. Fantastic. <laughs> But uh, would you like to tell us a bit about the debate we're going to listen to? Yes, uh, this is going to be art here, but also a political debate. Uh, because the 
Nordic Gender Equality Ministers uh, will be here. Uh, the four countries, Finland couldn't come, and two of the three autonomous territories, that is Greenland and the Faroe Islands, will also be here. And it's my job also to ask them questions, right? And I think that in the Nordic countries, you know we have a good record in the world. In the UN you are listening to the Nordic countries. But I also think that maybe we are sleeping a little bit uh, like uh, Sleeping Beauty on what we have done. You know, we're not number one in the world in terms of women's representation. That is Rwanda, right? I'm very proud of that. Uh, but also we have a Nordic competition, and I want to encourage the Nordic competition uh, because it was Sweden who started with the criminalizing buying of sex. Now Norway has expanded this, right? Well, in Norway now it's even further because it's criminalizing to buy sex if you're Norwegian to buy it abroad. Sweden hasn't done that yet, right? And Sweden have never had a women prime minister. Isn't that embarrassing? Mm. Uh, of all the Nordic countries, uh, it is Iceland who is in the front runner in terms of uh, paternal leave, three months reserved for the fathers, right? And in Denmark, there are none. Um, and uh, it was always also Norway who took uh, the question of quotas for women to the boards of the company, and Sweden hasn't done that yet. Denmark is a little bit vague of that. Uh, Iceland has done it, uh, Finland hasn't done it. So I like this Nordic competition to be the best in gender equality. Ah. That's fantastic. Let's hope that they really grab the competition spirit here. Uh, but first, we will listen to some music. Uh, we are going to listen to a music piece by, by Andrea Tarodi. It's made for orchestra, and it's called Camelio Pardalis. And then we will listen to um, uh, Ak Ak, which is Swedish folk music performed by Åke Vinda. And finally, we will listen to lyrics and music by Reindeer. Nightwish, it's called. Camelio Pardalis is made for orchestra and the conductor is Anna Maria Helsing. And behind me, we have Malmö Opera Orchestra. Please welcome them.
It takes the odds to find the deep But if we manage to all one day First then we know who came to stay Just thinking about tomorrow is making you sad It's making 
Thank you. Yes, how here you have all the Nordic gender equality ministers and finally not last the executive director of the UN Women. <laughs> And we will start this political part of the closing ceremony uh, by handing over to the ministers uh, this document which has been made during uh, this conference, uh, the Declaration Feministiske Overenskommelser og Krav. And I will pass the floor to Lone Alice Johansson from the Steering Nordic Steering Committee. Please. <laughs> So this is a document uh, with a lot of demands, requests and wishes for the future uh, coming out of all the debates uh, leading up to this conference and during this conference. So thank you to the committee who has made this document. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So now uh, we will start our discussion uh, and it's a great pleasure for me to be able here first to introduce the uh, gender equality ministers from Sweden, uh, Iceland, Greenland and Norway. Please give them a hand. And it works like this, that the minister has got three, minu three minutes, it's very tight uh, timetable here, and then I'll pose uh, one question, and then we go to the next minister. So the first minister I want to introduce to you is, of course, the Swedish Maria Arnholm from the Liberal Party, Folkpartiet, who's a minister of gender equality and also uh, on uh, education. Please, Maria. Dear fellow feminists, I came here with high expectations. When my 
government decided to make a financial contribution of quite substance to this, to this very historical conference, I pictured some great things. But my friends, my expectations have been exceeded. I have met thousands of feminists of all ages, of different opinions, and I have been discussing and I have been learning. And I just want to share two of my meetings. One was yesterday with Anna. She's seven years old. She lives in Malmö. She brought her mother here. And she was so angry because she was not allowed to play football in her school because the teacher said that girls don't do that. And this is 2014. But she had a badge that said feminist. That is one good reason for this meeting. The second meeting I want to share is, it was this morning when a lot of you were sleeping. I went up and I had a meeting with Madame Pumsile, the executive director of UN Women. We, it, was, it was an early hour, I was quite tired, but she got, really got me going, she got me on fire because she draw up the lines for the job we have to do, the Nordic countries together with UN Women, to make sure that the ongoing work in UN to make new, better, strong uh, goals for the world to be so much better, not the least for women and girls. Thank you, Madame Pumsila, for coming here and giving us all the fire we need. Finally, I want to thank the Nordic Forum for this document. I know it's been a great de deal of effort put into this in working groups all over the Nordic countries, on, e on mail, in meetings. And I really look forward to take part even more intense in, into this. But I, I just want to point out that one of the many demands is that the Nordic governments should ratify the European Convention on preventing and combating men's violence against women and domestic violence. And let me just fi finalize this short speech with, with assuring you that in a very short time the Swedish government will ratify the Istanbul Convention. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, you very all for much. Coming. In fact, it's only Denmark who has ratified the Istanbul Convention mm -hmm. so far, and I hope the rest will follow. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you very much, Ma Maria. Um, uh, there has been a lot of discussion uh, about anti feminism, about hate speech uh, at uh, this uh, Nordic Forum. Uh, we don't really know whether this is new or whether uh, this was just what men used to say when they had five bars in the pub. But now you have the social media, and you have hate speak against women politicians. Uh, what are you going to do? Can you do something about it? And what is the balance here between doing something about this kind of hate speech and the freedom of speech principle? I think, I think this is a very important but also delicate question because the balance between hate speech and freedom of speech is very, very delicate. And I think, we, I, I think this is not new. It's a new platform. It's the same hatred as it is old as, as the earth. And I think we should always combat it. And that is, we should not... We should not uh, uh, pull this out from, from, from hate speech as such. I think we should combat it, but we, we as women have had a very good, um, um, it's, it, the freedom of speech is very important to us. And I think women all over the world can agree to that. So, so let's fight it, but with, with free weapons. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Maria Anholm. And the next speaker here is uh, Iklo Harvardotier from Iceland, from the Centre Party, Famsogna Flokurin. Uh, and I have two questions, because, and you have more minutes, because Aiklo is both from the Gender Equality Minister from Iceland and also the Chair of the Nordic Corporation on Gender Equality. So please, Iklo. Thank you. Thank you. Aiklo. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for these wonderful four days. It's been absolutely um, invigorating to be here with all of you. And every one of you that are sitting here or participated in the Nordics Forum have made this into uh, the wonderful event that it has been. And our former president was here, uh, Ms. Vigdis uh, Fimbotovtir. And she mentioned the importance of an event of the, uh, the, uh, in 1975 in Iceland when 25,000 Icelandic women took the day off to emphasize the importance of women's contribution to the Iceland economy. And it was an event like the Nordic Forum. And it shows when women stand together, when women come together, they can actually change societies. And that happened in Iceland, and it's happened in all the Nordic countries, and we're also working on changing the world. Right? <laughs> but it's also, I think, I would like to mention that it, it is exactly the, the tireless campaign of the women's movements in the Nordic that we can thank for all the achievements that, and the successes that we've had. Women's lists, women's parties, and even big societal shocks like we had in Iceland in 2008 have made it possible for women to step up and deal with a lot of difficult issues uh, that maybe some men couldn't. And all of these things have influenced both the men and the women and have changed attitudes. We in Iceland are especially proud of the fact that 80% of Icelandic women are active in the labor market. And it is so important to remember that we need both men and women in the labor market if we intend to continue to have a strong welfare society in the Nordic countries. We need everyone in the labor market. We politicians need more tax money so we can do all the things we need to do. We don't get that if we don't have people working. I believe that in this final statement here, the Nordic Forum, we are presented with a unique opportunity to, uh, for promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. We are working on examining uh, the Millennium Development Goals and deliberating a new development framework. And I believe that without uh, the full participation of women, we simply will not be able to achieve the equal and the fair world that we all want to live in. And I'm especially here since I'm here also as a Minister of Nordic Cooperation. We just had a panel discussion, all the, the, the ministers of gender equality uh, and in the North. And it was quite obvious from that discussion that we have a lot to do yet. We, even if we can say today that the North is, the Nordic countries are the most, one of the most equal regions in the world, we have, we're not there yet. There's no country in the world that has achieved full equality, like Druda just mentioned quite so eloquently here in the beginning. So there's a lot still to do. And we, we wrote down all the notes, uh, all the points that, that, that uh, the, the, the participants in the panel debate mentioned. There are a lot of things that we are doing, and gender equality is a major issue for us that are working in Nordic cooperation, and will continue to be that. I would also like to invite you all to come for a 40 year <laughs> Jubileum, uh, Jubileum conference in, in the end of, Reyke, uh, end of August in Reykjavik where we'll be celebrating the fact that we have been cooperating for 40 Thank years. You. Thank you. <laughs> and especially if you pay the travel for all of us, we will all be there. Um, I have a question for you as in the capacity of Gender Equality Minister. Uh, in fact, Iceland is the front runner in terms of reserving some of the months of the parental leave for the fathers. Iceland has the three months for mother, three months for father, and three months which you can share between you. It's almost as close to the individualization as you can come. Uh, this is the front runner country, and I want, um, I want you, Eglo um, Lo, to, uh, to tell the other countries that they should, they should do, do the, the same. same? 
<laughs> what is uh, what is uh, what is your experience? We we've had it in place for 14 years, and we believe it has worked. We have the numbers to prove it. Uh, but it's also such a great example of the importance to um, have put forth legislations, pr proposals that benefit both men and women when it comes to gender equality. And I think the Icelandic parental legislation does that exactly. It's about 90% of all men that use, that, that, that take their parent to leave. You said nine or 90? Almost 90%. 90. Friends. And about... <laughs> And about uh, 20, more than 20% actually take more than their quota. And what I think is so important is our studies have shown that this has impacted the way the young men in Iceland view themselves as, you know, what, what is being a good man. They, they do mention that, you know, a, a good man is tall, has a beard. But they, they do also say that a good, a good man is a good father. And that is so important. That's right. Thank you very much. Um, now I have a question, a critical question to you as a, a chair of the Nordic uh, Gender Equality Corporation. The first is about uh, the closing down of the NIC, the Nordic uh, Institute for Women's Studies and Gender Research, which was closed down in, 19, uh, in, um, in uh, 2012. And also the total budget for the Gender Equality uh, Corporation in the Nordic has been decreased from 9.1% a million to 8.9 in 2014. So how do you really see the prioritization? How do you see this in the future? Uh, are we degrading the Nordic cooperation? Uh, as you know, all, well, I think most of the Nordic countries have been going through cutdowns and had, had difficulties. And unfortunately, we have also had to cut down the budget of the Nordic Corporation. Uh, we have not closed down NIC. We have changed the way it operates. So, uh, and Nick will be uh, operating, uh, administrating a funding scheme, which we hope that can open up and do even better uh, research on gender equality. And I do also hope that as uh, things hopefully start to go better for each of the Nordic countries, that we can continue to e increase funding for the Nordic cooperation and also for gender equality. But you closed it down as an independent Nordic institute. Right. We changed the way it operates, but it's still there. And, uh, and I also think, just remind you that, you know, concerning the funding scheme, that we think it's quite important to get really good res research and hopefully that will, you know, do, do that with the changes that we have done. But I, like I mentioned, none of us, no politicians, believe me, like to cut down and, and go through uh, uh, down cuts in, in the budgets. But we did have to do that with, with all of the budget for the Nordic Cooperation. And I hope that we'll, we see some changes. But that well, will, of course, depend on how we're doing overall. Thank you very much. Thank Hitler. you. And then I have the pleasure uh, to give the floor to, the, uh, to Marta Lohn Olsen, who is uh, coming from uh, the, who's a Minister of Family and Justice uh, in the government of uh, the uh, Greenland, Grönland's Land Studio, Nalakar Suisut. Right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I want to, to mention that Greenland got a women prime minister before Denmark. Uh, in fact, it's uh, only the Faroe Island and Sweden who hasn't got a women prime minister. Please. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Gender equality has always been a popular issue of debate in Greenland. But the debate has mostly been on equality for the Greenlandic people and the right of indigenous people. This issue has dominated other equality issue in the public debate, also gender equality. Today the diff situation is different. On 21 of June 2009, Greenlandic self-rule was a reality. A majority of Greenlandic population supports this major step forward. Today, the Greenlandic people is recognized by international law, and Greenlandic is the first language in Greenland. Thank 
Greenland should, like other Nordic countries, be the forefront of gender equality. We can act to achieve this when we cooperate. More women, women than men are degree. The tendency is the same in the future. If Greenland is to be competitive on the global market, we can't not only focus on 50% of the talent in our society. It is necessary to create space and opportunities for all talents and make sure that women are involved in the decisions making in the boards of both private and public companies. <laughs> Greenland has adopted a new act of, on equality, which ensures that all boards of several owned companies must have an equal number of women and men. As Minister of Social Affairs, I feel that it's very important that the debate on gender equality is going on, not just in an echo chamber, where the elites debate gender equality. I'm very concerned that, and has made its priority that Greenland's fight violence against women effectively. In 2030, the Greenlandic Parliament and adopted a tragedy and action plans against violence from 24 to 2017. In Greenland, the de development of the welfare society has a gender aspect, which is a key aspect of the Greenlandic context. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I have a question uh, uh, to Marta Lund Olsen. Thank you very much. And Marta will answer in Danish and I'll translate it. Uh, this new law, 50% men and women in the public companies. We're talking about fishery and mining and, and all those very male dominated fields. I heard that you did this very rapidly, not given them two or three years and there have been a lot of discussion that you were throwing out the men. How did that work? What then fungerede det? Altså, de fleste øh, store selskaber i Grønland er øh, selvstyrede aktieselskaber med bestyrelser. Og vi arbejder hen imod, at alle bestyrelsesmedlemmerne er lige, lige fordelt mellem mænd og kvinder. Og det, det, det er noget, vi, er i gang, vi har i gang sat. So, uh, what Marta Lund-Lulsen is saying that, that uh, this is being implemented very rapidly and it's 50% men and 50% women everywhere in all those uh, owned by the, the Greenland government, right? So this is, this is in fact number one in the, in, in the Nordic countries right now. <laughs> Tak, Marta. Uh, and then we come to Norway. I'm very happy to introduce to you the uh, Minister for Gender Equality and Integration and Social Affairs, right? The last portfolio. Uh, Solvay Horne, who's from the Progress Party. And as you know, Norway was not the best now, but the first to make a law uh, with quotas for at least 40% men and women in all the company boards of the big, big, big uh, companies, private and public. <laughs> and this has been known all over the world, and, and now we know that Iceland has come and Greenland has come, but France is doing the same, Spain is doing the same now. Uh, but then I have a critical <laughs> question to you, because when I read the program of your party, the Norwegian Progress Party, it states in their program from 1913 that the relation between the sexes, groups and individual, individuals should change naturally in the labor market. And your program states that competition makes a company interested in securing the most qualified employees regarding, regardless of gender uh, affiliation. 
And I will return to that because now I, I realize that you had to start. <laughs> I was so eager. Please, yeah. you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, and dear old friends, it's good to be here in Malmö today. I came this morning, but I can really feel the atmosphere. And I look forward to read this, uh, this document, because I think you are working very hard with this. My congratulations to the organizer and all, to all the participation. Thank you for making this Nordic Forum a reality. The Beijing platform was a groundbreaking document. In the years to come, it will be important to safeguard these basic human rights. The CEDAW Convention has been ratified by 187 state parties. An impressive commitment. But the harsh reality for many girls and women is that there is still a long way to go before the Convention is fully implemented by all member states. To me, gender equality is about securing equal rights and opportunities for all. Gender equality is a basic human rights and also a means of achieving economic growth and development. Gender equality is also about absence of violence. Violence against women and girls is a manifestation of gender discrimination. We must all commit ourselves to fight all forms for violence against women and girls. We must protect their health and well-being, especially their sexual and reproductive health and rights. We know that nearly all mater maternal deaths occur is in developing countries. Every year, 47,000 women die from the complication of unsafe abortion. For every woman who loses her life, 20 more suffer serious injury or permanent disability. The fact that 800 women die every day due to pregnancy and childbirth is unacceptable. We are facing many challenges, but education is therefore very important. We must ensure basic education for all girls throughout the world. Girls' education is the single most important driver of other development goals. This is why the Norwegian government has made education of girls a pri priority in these development policies. We are facing many challenges. That is why it is important to gather here in Malmö. That is why it is important to let the Nordic voice be heard loud and clear, defining women and girls. Let us unite in our call, our core for the defense of women's rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and sorry for yeah. confusing. So I just want to ask you again, are you keeping this fantastic law <laughs> of uh, quotas for women in the public and men in the public boards? I hope so. <laughs> yes, I can say yes, it was. Uh, actually, when I started my political career, I was uh, quoted into the local uh, county. But in the Progress Party, we believe that all human beings are the equi equal value and that talent and capacity are equal shared among all of us, regardless of gender or color or any other characteristics. We believe that the quota system is unnecessary. But at the same time... Well, th there's another sentence. Yeah. Please listen. <laughs> but at the same time, the Norwegian government believes that the Nordic model, where women participate at almost the same rate as as men in, for instance, for the labor market, gives us an competitive access. I can assure you that the Norwegian government has no plans as of today's changing the excitement existing quota law in addition to wow. um, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> yeah. but in addition to regulation by law the government will change and build its policy on positive motivation means thank you very much do i have two minutes where are the people who are i have two minutes okay so i have one uh, further question because uh, uh, there were two who didn't come, so we have a little more time. I, I have one question, it's, and it's mainly probably for Maria, but any of you. 
Uh, this is an example from my workplace. I'm a professor at Stockholm University. We have the most fantastic gender equality programs, gender equality plans, one, two, three years. We have the most uh, fantastic diversity plans and programs for many years. Uh, Sweden is the world champion in gender equality plans, I would say. Uh, but the group that needs this the most, it, do it doesn't go for them. Those who are cleaning the university, mostly women with an immigrant background, because this is outsourced. It's a private firm, and every three years they make a new negotiation, and another firm come in, and they press their salaries and say they have to work. So here we have a structural change in the Nordic countries, which is really challenging our gender equality policy. Right? I, did, I, I really don't get, get why you applaud, because shouldn't women who are employed by private companies be allowed to have equality plans? We have a legislation in Sweden that, that asks for all companies, private, I, don't, I, I think it's, it's a very strange thing to, to let's put all women in, uh, in public uh, uh, and just care about the women are employed by the public. I want a legislation that is looked after and that we are really get, getting into operation. That's why we have given a lot of more money to the authority, the Arbetsmiljö, uh, the, dis the discrimination ombudsman. I care for women who are, who are employed by the university, but also by the companies who employ cleaners. So please. Thank you. I think we have run out of time. So I want to thank the minister from Norway, Greenland, Iceland, and Sweden. Please give them a hand. Thank you. Yeah, that was the first debate or the first discussions and presentations. Um, all this music we are listening to today is made by female composers. Uh, and it's, yes, give that a hand. And it's very beautifully put together by Anna Lena Laurin, who is a composer, and we will listen to her piece later on. She's also a member of Kvast, and Kvast is a female assembling of Swedish composers and has a mission to that performances of music composed by female composers shall radically increase. And give a hand to that. We will now listen to Hur ska jag säga? Hur kan jag säga? A music piece of, for vocal and orchestra uh, by uh, the vocalist Iris Bergkrans. Conductor Anna Maria Helsing, Malmö Opera Orchestra. The next piece we are going to listen to uh, is De Brinner en Eld and Stuvmoden. Swedish folk music by Åkervinda. And the last one, Infinite Denial. Lyrics and music by Reindeer. Please.
Det brinner en eld, den brinner klar, den brinner i tusen kransar. Det brinner en eld, den brinner klar, den brinner i tusen kransar. Så vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. 
För du har väl varit mitt första steg och du ska väl bli mitt sista. Och om jag i dig till min kan få så ska väl mitt hjärta brista. Så vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Vi andar i dag, vi dall i dag i Det brinner en eld, den brinner klar, den brinner i tusen kransar. Så vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. För du har väl varit mitt första steg och du ska väl bli mitt sista. Och om jag i dig till min kan få så ska väl mitt hjärta brista. Så vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig mera. Jag vänd dig om, ta mig i famnen en gång och dansa med mig. Thank you very much. That was one kind of love song. Now we're going to sing another one. It's called Stuvmoden, which means the stepmother. And it's a story about the love between three children and their mother. And their mother is dead. And how their love for her brings her spirit up through the grave to confront the stepmother, to make sure that the stepmother will take really good care of her three kids. Here it comes. Småbarnen de frågar sin fader om lov Om det på sin moders grav kun få gå Du är det lange och skön jungfru
Tack. Tack så mycket. Thank you. Tack, tack. Yes. Thank you very much to this fantastic music. So now we have the second round of questions here, and I'm very happy and please welcome representative the minister from Denmark, Faroe Islands, and the executive director of the UN Women. And the rules are uh, as previously, the two ministers will get three minutes each, and then we have one minute for one question from me. And uh, uh, executive director, uh, Ms., uh, Madame Pomsile, will get six, eight minutes, and then two questions. It's very strict. So please, Manu Sarain from Denmark, the Social Liberal Party, the Radikale Venstre, Minister for Children, Gender Equality, Integration, and Social Affairs. Please. Thank you very much. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I talked to one of my friends, telling her about this uh, forum, uh, telling her about my speech. And actually, her comments to me were quite surprising. She said, is there really anything left fighting for as a Nordic woman today? And actually, I, I was quite surprised. And I know that we have come very far when it comes to equal rights and opportunities for women in our Nordic countries. When I look at my daughter, she's 17. When I ask her, she finds it very, very natural that she uh, enjoys the same rights as her two brothers. And when we look at the past, uh, and when I talk to my daughter about the past, about women not having right to their own bodies, not having right to their own money, and uh, uh, no uh, future, no education, for her it's quite surprising because this is today, this is 2014, and all the achievements that we have been making for many years, for her is very, very natural. So why gather here today in 2014 and discuss Nordic gender equality? I think that is very important because while more and more Nordic uh, women are holding university degrees, there's still women amongst us who, who, who uh, life are restrained and controlled by conservative uh, communities. While more and more Nordic women are getting great careers, uh, sharing homely duties with their modern men, there are still uh, women um, uh, among us uh, exposed to violence. The number in Denmark is about 29,000 women each year getting uh, uh, offered for, for, for violence. And that's too many. Even more, uh, one woman is too many. So we have to keep on uh, fighting that struggle. We also see a growing number of girls and women exposed to everyday sexism getting picked on, molested only because of their gender. This uh, behavior happens at Facebook, at the street, in the discotheques, uh, in the night, uh, night time, and uh, it's only to, to limit uh, women's uh, personal freedom and participation in the public uh, debate. We also have to combat that problem. Looking, ab looking abroad, we see that achievements and progress made uh, in the recent past uh, years have been under uh, pressure, uh, uh, especially at CSW. Conservative countries uh, and organizations are threatening women's rights. We see girls getting uh, denied uh, on education. We see girls forced to marry five times older men at, at, at an age where the only thing that they really ought to think about is playing every day. We see women stoned to death for marrying men uh, uh, not accepted by the society. So for me, I think, and it tells me with a certainty that we still have a war to fight. 
At home, we still have a war to fight, and abroad, we still have a war to fight. In the Nordic countries, we are the first movers. We have an obligation to work for a better and a more worthy life for women all over the world. This fight, we have to fight together, uh, states and NGOs, uh, developed and undeveloped nations, and women and men. For women and us as men, it is worth to be uh, able to unfold their human uh, potential anytime and anywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Manu. So this is my question. This is the paradox of Denmark, even under a center left government. There's been a lot of discussion of Den Denmark because in the 70s, where the red stockings, it was the Swedish and Norwegian women who were feminists were coming to Denmark to learn. Uh, and how would you characterize Denmark saying that Sweden was the first to criminalize buying sex from prostitutes. Norway now have an even more radical uh, law that you criminalize also if you buy sex abroad. But Denmark was the first to decriminalize pornography and the first in the world to open up for legal registration, registration of same-sex marriage. So today we have the situation that Swedish men go to Copenhagen for prostitution and single Swedish women go to Copenhagen for insemination. Right? So how would you characterize Denmark? Is this the, the libertarians among the Nordic, the laissez-faire country? Or are we just lagging behind the other Nordic countries now? First of all, uh, Swedish and uh, Norwegian uh, feminists are still welcome in Denmark. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think you have to see uh, gender equality in a broader uh, aspect uh, than that. Because we are doing very well. When, when we are measured uh, all over the world, we can see that we are uh, in the top. When we uh, go to the no uh, negotiations in the CSW, uh, everybody's looking uh, towards the Nordic countries and also Denmark. And they're saying that we are looking at your, uh, your countries because we have to tell, and we tell our politicians that this is the way to do it. And uh, I'm very, very proud that we are in, in Denmark, also in, uh, in the Nor Nordic countries, are first movers. So. Uh, Actually, I'm very proud of our achievement uh, uh, and, uh, when we're talking about gender equalities. I'm born in India, and when you look at my uh, country of birth, sure. and when you compare it to Denmark, you know, I'm very proud, and I can say with a, a proudness to my wife, to my, sorry, my ex-wife, I just have to get used to it, <laughs> <laughs> and my children, <laughs> that we have... Uh, that, <laughs> that we have worked for many years for gender equality, and I'm so proud of that. Thank you very much, Manu. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very happy now to introduce to you uh, Johan Dahl, who is uh, the Minister for Trade and Industry uh, in the Faroe Islands, and he comes from the Conservative Party, Samban Flokorin. Thank Please. you very much. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor for me to be here and to be able to participate on this big event on gender equality. This year we are celebrating the 40th anniversary for the Nordic Cooperation on Gender Equality and next year many countries celebrate the 100 years anniversary for women's right to vote. Hence, the issue of gender equality is not a new topic. After all these years of universal suffrage and cooperation on gender equality, we can conclude that we have made substantial progress. Today, both sexes have the same formal and legal rights in almost all aspects of society, maybe with exception of the parental leave bills in the different Nordic countries, where many countries still lack to implement equal rights. Even though we can affirm that we have reached equal formal rights on almost all areas, at the same time we can see that these formal rights have not been rendered into gender equality de facto. Still, we do not have equality in the labor market, in the parliaments, in relation to child care, parental leave, education, and many other fundamental societal institutions. The struggle for gender equality is not over. The fact has been richly illustrated these four days in Nordic Forum where participants, organizations, and NGOs from all over the world have illustrated and treated different aspects of the gender equality. After all these years of formal equal rights and cooperation on gender equality, one can ask, 
Why have we not managed to eradicate inequality between the sexes? Why do we in the Nordic countries, which brag of being the most equal in the world, still not have equality? I believe that the key to reaching real equality lies in changing the institutions that forms and shape our kids' perception of the world. Here I am relating to the family as an institution and to the educational system. These institutions are the pillars on which macroeconomic structures, the labor market and politics rest on. If we can achieve more equal roles in parenting and an edu educational system that promotes equality and treats girls and boys not, necess not necessarily equal, but in relation to their specific and personal strengths and weaknesses, I believe we will change the ways our kids perceive the other sex and their own role in society. In the long term, more equal roles in these fundamental institutions will reflect on the labor market, on politics, and yes, on tolerance and equality in society at large. Treating people exactly the same does not lead to equality. On the contrary, we need to treat people differently and in accordance to specific and personal strengths and weaknesses. If we are to acquire equality, I think that this ground rule is often forgotten in the fight for equality. We need to build an educational system that acknowledges that people, the sexes, are different. In order to do this, we need both sexes in the homes, in the kindergartens, primary schools and universities. One of our primary goals, then, is not to focus on women's rights per se, but on how we can get men to participate in bringing up our kids to educate and teach in the kindergartens and schools. Equality here, I think, will lead to gender equality in society. Let me end by quoting Kofi Annan's word on equality. Gender equality is more than a goal in itself. It is a precondition for meeting the challenge of reducing poverty, promoting sustainable development, and building good governance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Johan Dahl. Um, I have a short question for you. Uh, there was this discussion, the, media, the panel between the Nordic Council, the Nordic ministers this morning, and you were telling that uh, you had the problem that lots of women, especially young women, are migrating from the Faroe Islands. You have a deficit of, of women. Um, I also learned that uh, not so long ago, rainbow families were also moving to Denmark in order to live a normal life. Uh, but I learn also very happily that most recently you have a shift in opinion in the Faroe Islands so that now two-thirds two of the population support civil marriage for gay couples. You are in the process, are you not, of making a new law? Please tell me. No, actually we are not in the progress of making a new law. What happens actually this year was that the, the parties which are not in coalition was putting forward a, a legal a law which uh, should uh, allow uh, uh, people to, to marry from the same kind. And it was not uh, getting through the parliament. But I think when you speak about these this things, as, as fair as Ireland is moving in the right direction, there's no doubt. And if you look at the parliament today, even though we don't have a majority which will bring this law through at present time, I'm sure that within a very short time, this thing will change because there is almost around 50-50 in the Parliament at the present time, which would like to get this through. And I actually sincerely hope that this will be possible within not so long. I think the young people are much more, um, uh, they, they are pushing, they are pushing these things in the right direction, actually. And they will have to, to, to get these things Thank happen. you very much. We hope that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I turn to my last speaker, uh, which is uh, the executive director of the UN Women. Uh, Madame Ponsile Mlabo Enzuka, and give her a hand. <laughs> and let me just thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Why are you leaving me alone? Uh, I thought you were supposed to stand here, but never mind. At any rate, <laughs> you know, uh, Ponsile in, in, the, in the organization and UN Women in New York, uh, you are called ED. Executive Director, that is much more easy. So the ED, Pomzile, has been the Vice President of South Africa. She has been the Minister of Trade and Industry 
and later a minister for mining and energy. And we are so pleased that you and your staff are here at the Nordic Forum. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And happy Father's Day to the fathers uh, who are here today. I would like to thank the Nordic Civil Society, the Nordic governments, for this wonderful opportunity. It has been a very important and a dynamic forum, informative, energizing, and a true milestone for the revival and the strengthening of feminism that we need for the 21st century. Because feminism it is about making choices for yourself and to be in solidarity with other women and to get out of your comfort zone so that you can champion the needs of other people in a manner that changed the world. So it is not only about what we will achieve for the Nordic women, it is also, also about what you can achieve for the women of the world. And we need you there. For one, we need you to reach equality in the Nordic countries because you are so close, so that through you, we can have best practice for the rest of the world. That's your homework. Thank you. This is your revolutionary responsibility to make the world a better place, to lead by example and to take full advantage of the space that you have. This is also our time as the women of the world. This is our time because we, are, we have reached an age where our beloved Beijing platform has become of age. It is going to be 20 and it will be 21 and it must never be the same. Life for women of the world must never be the same after Beijing plus 20. It must be a time when we end on our killings, when all girls and boys have equal access to education that has no stereotypes, when we reach a point when women farmers can own land, own credit, and are able to produce and keep the produce and the benefits of their sweat. It must be, it must be a time when women in boards of corporations will be represented in equal measure as men, and their contribution to growing inclusive economy will be made possible. It must be a time when hunger and poverty does not wear the face of a woman. This is our homework, moving from now 15 years until 2030, when we will be able to say gender equality has been achieved. For the first time ever, first time ever, the United Nations is proposing a date, put it in your calendar, a date when we should end gender equality. We now, in UN Women, not just need a strategic plan, we need a business plan so that we can have quantifiable goals and qualitative goals on how we're going to achieve this equality. Post-2015, as she has said, should not be called post-2015. It is about the future women want in 2030. We are so, pursuing <laughs> goals on the future women want in 2030, and we've got specific steps and achievements and goals that we must achieve as a result of that. So here we are with you, working with the women of the world, championing and leading in the areas of human rights and the many other areas that you have enumerated that we should uh, be pursuing in order to achieve our objectives. We will have activities to mark this very important moment in history. We are having regional meetings that you will also have here in Europe in November and all around the world so that we can collate the information about the status of the world. We have had national reports from your different countries and from those reports we will be able to find out all over the world the status of the women. We will have CSW next year as a highlight 
of recognizing what women have uh, achieved in the 20 years, what are the gaps, and we will be collating information so that your heads of state can be given the responsibility to lead, to lead emancipation of women so that when they come to the General Assembly in 2015 September, they can make concrete commitments because at CSW we will identify those things that need to be done in each country. So we need you to regard CSW 2015, CSW 59 as a game changer. As a game changer where we will put together destiny changing proposals to the governments and the people of the world about the status of women. And all of that will form and brief all of us about what we are taking to the negotiations for post 2015, not post 2015, the future <laughs> the women want yes. in 2030. This is, this is the agenda, it is clear. It is straightforward. It can be done. Am I right or am I right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is also about expanding the base for women. It is about bringing men to take their historic responsibility and be on the right side of history. It is about investing in young people and making sure that we've got an intergenerational force that is taking us forward. It is about making sure that it is not about the north or the south or the east or the west. It is about people of the world making history and making sure that as we empower women, we empower humanity. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madame Ponsile, Madame Edi, <laughs> uh, for coming. It's been so important for the Nordic Forum that you have been here with all your staff and bringing in the international uh, aspects of it. I have two questions for you. The one is about the Beijing Plus 20 conference, the fifth World Conference on Women, which we will not have. And there's been some criticism in the discussions here because a World Conference on Women is such a mobilizing thing. Uh, and maybe you could explain why are we not getting this fifth conference. Thank you very much for the opportunity to explain that. We are not going to have a conference of the magnitude of the other global conferences, world conferences that we have had. Because in 2014, in 2015, we have a global climate that is not favorable to the women's agenda. If we were to take the Beijing platform and put it in front of the nations of the world for enhancement, it will be opened up and there's a chance that we'll lose the things that we've already gained. The number of countries, either because of Catholicism or under fundamentalist religious beliefs that want to take away from the Beijing uh, plus 20, I'm sorry, from the Beijing platform of action as we know it, are so many and so strong that there's a real risk that we will end up moving backwards. But having said that, it is not because numerically in the world and amongst governments we have got more reactionary and backward-looking government, but the polarizing nature of those debates are of such a nature that we might not be able to have an agreement that we want. We therefore took a decision that we cannot afford to have a situation where, where all of those hard-won agreements that we already have in Beijing could be taken away. 
We want to preserve what we've gained in Beijing, to continue to enhance and to increase it. But because there's an opportunity to negotiate in the process that leads us to 2030 after the post-2015 agenda, we will then in that, in those negotiations, negotiate the enhancing and the adding and the arguing about the rights of women to their reproductive health and sexuality of men and women, the rights to ensure that there's comprehensive sex education and other rights rights now that are being contested without opening up the Beijing. It's a, it's a tactic. The second reason we can't have Beijing is that we cannot afford it. <laughs> UN Women just does not have that kind of budget, unfortunately. And one of the things that will be critical in post-2015, and as we lead towards the future we want in 2030, is to change the game as far as funding of women's work is possible. It just cannot be that we are in the situation that we are in. So we are also urging you to ensure that you are able to help us to ring fence resources that will support you and women so that we can play this major historic role in the next 15 years of delivering with you and with the women of the world, the, a world that is equal for men and for women. Thank you. It's, thank you very much. It's sad, but I, I, I do accept all the arguments here. Uh, uh, I would like to, to uh, point out that uh, Madame Ponsile is in fact uh, going around the world to conferences like this and making kind of mini women's uh, world conferences yes, yes. or in all the regions. And I just want to end now then by thanking you extremely much for being here and for being so inspiring. Uh, I, one of the things I like about the South African uh, colleagues is that you still call about, to talk about sisterhood and sisters. Let's give Madame Pasele a hand. <laughs> and thank you so much to the people of the Nordic, well, Nordic countries for the support that they've given the struggles of the people of the world, the struggles of South Africa, the struggles of women, and UN women. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now time has come for me to thank you very much. Thank you, Drud Dalarup. Thank you. You've been clarifying so many things with it, all these discussions with the ministers. It has been very clarifying, yes. Now we will listen to our final piece. And this, you have to listen very carefully because this is a world premiere it's first time played. It's uh, called Quests, and it's for soprano and orchestra, and lyrics and music by Annalena Laurin, soprano Gitta Maria Sjöberg, conductor Anna Maria Helsing, Malmö Opera Orchestra.
I'm just a piece and I cannot be moved. sufficiently naked and ready to change.
can be safe, old enough to die. She's old enough to die. To die. Can I see him?
that the power of life is worth. And you, you will detect it by living in time. You will see. Soloist, Gitta Maria Sjögren. Conductor Anna Maria Helsing, please. Conductor Anna Lena Laurin. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Concert smarter. René Aldi. Thank you very much. We also like to thank Orke Vinda and Reindeer. What a delightful music. 
What an encouraging speech, Madame Fusil. What a clarifying experience to listen to all the ministers. Now we know what we have to do when we go home and work. Ikke sant, Danmark? Ikke sant? No. I say pep to you. Um, time has come to an end uh, for this Nordic Forum. It's time has come to say goodbye. And I feel grateful. I feel so grateful to have been able to listen to all of you. You have opened my mind and I've learned the importance of new terms, of new aspects. I learned your demands for act on peace and security. I've learned also how to understand the importance of the meaning of the word consent Uh, the new aspects of fear. I've learned also all the new movements, the joy of all the new movements we have. And when I look at all of you, I think of all the effort, all the organizations, associations, how many we are and how important this is for us and for our children for now and in the future. And I talk a lot here, but truly I feel... I'm speechless, and that's good, because now it's time to th- welcome the f- fantastic steering group behind Nordic Forum, who's worked with all this for so many years. Please welcome Peggy Heikinen. Dear friends, dear sisters, dear fellow feminists, Before we all travel home, it's time for thanks. Firstly, I wish to thank our inspiring hostess, Ellen Newman. Thank you for guiding us, not only through this marvelous closing ceremony, but also during four whole days of program in the arena, Truly fantastic work. You're absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In this connection, I also wish to thank the many speakers and moderators that have participated in the arena and in the Nordic main program and discussions. I am here on behalf of the Nordic Steering Group of the Forum. The Steering Group consists of the women's umbrella organizations in all five Nordic countries, as well as of representatives from the autonomous areas, together representing 200 women's organizations that for the last couple of years have planned the event. Hundreds and hundreds of persons from these organizations have been working very hard with different tasks in the countries, informing, mobilizing, and planning events. The steering group wishes to sincerely thank the whole secretariat of the forum for their extremely committed and vigorous work. And also the 200 voluntary workers without whom the forum simply would not have been carried out. We thank the event management company, MCI, who has been in charge of the huge and complex conference arrangements. Our very special thanks go to our wonderful host city, the city of Malmö, for an extraordinary cooperation carried on with heart and soul. (laughs) 
There are several other sponsors and cooperation partners that have made the Nordist Forum possible and that have contributed economically, politically and or practically. We wish to cordially thank the Government of Sweden, the Nordic Council of Ministers and Svenska Postkodlotteriet, Region Skåne and Skåne Trafiken, the Norwegian and Finnish governments and the city of Copenhagen for your valuable support. The Embassy of Denmark, Musik i Syd and the Municipality of Eslöv have contributed to this concert we just heard. And Sydsvenskan and City have been our media partners. It is unfortunately not possible to thank all the contributors by name. However, there are two persons that I would like to welcome on stage. Gertrud Åström and Caroline Matson. Sveriges kvinnolobby, the Swedish, Swedish women's lobby, has been the main arranger of Nordisk Forum and the organization that carries the economic responsibility. Gertrud has, as chair of the kvinnolobby, not only been in charge, but is also the initiator, the mother of Nordisk Forum in Malmö. Thank you for the thousands of hours you have dedicated to this. <laughs> On behalf of the steering group, I also wish to extend cordial thanks to all the members, board members of Sveriges Kvinnolobby. Caroline has been in charge of the Secretariat, a very demanding task and a race against time, but carried out with high professionalism and commitment and always with calmness and a smile. In these warm thanks, we wish to include every single member of the Secretariat. Your hard working during very long hours and your ideas have inspired us all and made our forum dreams come true. <clears throat> Last but not least, I would like to extend the thanks to you all and everybody who has left. The many organizers of programs and the exhibitors and to every single participant of the forum. It is you who have brought new action on women's rights into the inspiring, diverse and powerful manifestation of feminism and gender equality that we have witnessed in Malmö. Thank you. But the work for women's rights does not end here. Actually, it's just a new beginning. Thank you and have a safe journey home.